Good evening. Uh, I would like to welcome the audience of the Big Book Festival, the eighth edition, Pure Love. I would like to say good evening to all those who are physically here uh, at the Cultural Center with me, but I would like to welcome everyone who's watching us online. The topic is going to be very hot, even though the weather might also be a little, a little strange, a little weird. We're getting even some weather alerts about violent storms, but I think that our topic will be hot enough uh, to occupy us and make us oblivious to all the weather dangers. So the Vagina Bible um, that's going to be at the very center of our talk uh, with Jen Gunter. I hope that it will be a good reason for us to start talking about female body. I'm very much into the topic. MPIC Go uh, already uh, has published some of my podcasts called uh, Sense and um, Eroticity. Mm. Uh, I do that together with a colleague of mine who is a um, sexual education expert who has been for years talking about sexual fulfillment and sexual well-being for females, for women. And he, um, I'm just uh, one of the interviewers uh, in my podcast. She, my colleague, is um, the heroine and the expert. And from what I'm hearing from my audience, um, this topic is very much uh, needed, relevant, and topical, something that people have been waiting for. So hope, uh, keep your fingers crossed that we can uh, make another round of our podcast. So right now, uh, doctor, uh, gynecologist, um, Canadian who um, works in the States, uh, the Vagina Bible. I'm not very surprised by the title, but I think lots of people might be a little bit shocked that the word Bible comes up here. Uh, and I agree. I think it's a good name for the book, and I think it's a good phrase, especially that this particular part of human body is really sacred and sensational. But well, I'm not going to talk about the book that I haven't written. So let's talk to the author. Uh, Jen Gunter was supposed to be in her garden in California, but somehow it didn't pan out. She's not in her garden, even though her backdrop is wonderful. Uh, this California sun is really <laughs> echoing Good through your room. Or Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. Yes, we are so gifted to have you here tonight. Actually, I'm going to uh, speak in Polish because all those terms in English, I mean, you know, vagina and others, <laughs> probably could be too <laughs> difficult to us. So um, let me uh, speak in Polish whenever you want or somebody from us would like to say anything in English, we can do it. Anyway, uh, this is so great to have you here. And my first question is in Polish. So don't be afraid. You will hear your translation in a way. So <laughs> uh, it will be easy for you. Uh, Dear Jen, it's 2020 right now, and for a year your book has been uh, victorious uh, in all its glory in so many countries, Russia, Ukraine, Romania, Spain, Germany, New Zealand, China, uh, well, not to mention the States, Canada, Great Britain, right? But I was thinking about your title. I already uh, complimented the title. Uh, how many you were criticized, ostracized? for using the word Bible, the sacred word Bible, in the context of one of the most important organs in the human body, namely the wonderful female vagina. Well, there were two uh, points of contention in, uh, in the American press. So first of all, Bible as you mentioned, that uh, people were a bit shocked. But I pointed out that, you know, Bible really means the definitive work, the word, so this is a definitive work and the vagina should be worshiped. So, uh, and sadly here in the United States, there is a book called the gun Bible and no one got upset about that. Uh, and then uh, when I was uh, promoting the book, uh, 
Twitter wouldn't um, wouldn't take ads because the word vagina was in it. Uh, so it's important to say these words. Uh, absolutely, to understand. Sure, I get that. I know that Facebook blocks all the words around sex and sexuality. Don't you think it's crazy? One can talk about sex, sexuality, educating people without being in any way crass, even though I know that uh, owners of those platforms are afraid about that, are afraid of that. Absolutely. So when you can't say a word, when you can't say vagina, vulva, clitoris, orgasm, what you're implying is that there's something dirty or dangerous about those terms. And I stopped. They're body parts, just like your elbow, your hair. It's no different. And then what happens is people then, this culture of shame is just perpetuated. And then when people want to find information out about their body parts, they're either too embarrassed to ask because you don't ask about shameful things, or they go to clandestine places and they get misinformation. So knowledge is power. And the most important thing about female health is to use the correct words so we can get rid of the shame and then we all know what we're talking about. You mentioned shame. You mentioned uh, knowledge being power, being powerful. Do you believe, just like myself and my colleague, my partner in crime, Joanna Kaszka, who is a sexual educator uh, in my podcast, together with me, that words define our reality. I have to tell you that I run a series of podcasts, uh, Sense and Eroticity, sort of as a paraphrase to Jane Austen, Sense and Sensibility. We call it Sense and Eroticity. Mm -hmm. And we decided to do those podcasts to talk about female sexuality in a way that's smart, but also sensual, a little bit sexual. And our thesis um, is that our language shapes the way we see our sexuality. Your book is written in a very approachable manner simple language without shaming or trying to shame or lecture anyone trying to be condescending there's nothing like this in your book your experience nearly 30 years working with female patients in your doctors in your examination room in your practice uh, has taught you a lot how to speak about those things but with your patients is there a certain shame is there a certain uh, reluctance to talk about those topics is it your everyday experience with yeah. patients so even in the even in the gynecologist's office and with the doors closed and there's nobody who can listen uh, you know except me and you can say anything to me i mean i've heard it all and um and all i want to do is help people it's sometimes so hard for for women to speak about their bodies and i think that this is the ultimate um, weapon of the patriarchy, right? So if you can't ask your sisters or your mom or your girlfriends or your doctor about what's going on with your body, then you are really at a disability compared to people who can. And when you think about how much um, a woman's body is affected by her reproduction versus a man's body, right? You know, they don't, um, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, that 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 women have this different physiology and the you know the fact that we that most women menstruate i mean not all women do but um during the reproductive years the majority of women menstruate and that we have this biology that requires often different types of intervention and when you can't talk about that you can't talk about the kind of sex you want to have you can't you know i i talk to women who have been with the same partner for 20 years and they've never had an orgasm or when i ask them about their foreplay they say what's that and you're just, you know, you're so devastated that they've spent this amount of time without having that accurate information. And so, yeah, I think it's, it is an incredible act of control to prevent women for, from talking about their bodies. Absolutely, right? Totally true. You also mentioned something. You have also mentioned something in your book that I came across when I was getting ready to my podcast, to running my podcast, namely Sigmund Freud, who is the father, founding father of psychoanalysis. Uh, and actually, we owe him the fact that we were thrown in jail. Namely, he had this theory that only vaginal orgasm was the right one, and the one coming from the clitoris was just for young women uh, who are just in the beginning, during the beginning phases of their sexual life, and it uh, really did a lot of harm, actually. So what about this myth about those different types of orgasms? 
Yeah, I think that um, Freud, Freudian myth about uh, orgasms is one of the biggest uh, original sins, I think, as when we talk about sort of women's health in modern terms, because, you know, all roads to the brain for orgasm lead to the clitoris. And Freud was either unaware that the clitoris is this really large structure that isn't just what you see. It wraps around the urethra and extends down underneath the labia, or he didn't care. Who knows? Um, and we have no idea what his sexual experience was, or I don't anyway. Uh, so yeah, this idea that the only mature orgasm is with penile penetration is absolutely incorrect. I mean, many, many women can't um, orgasm with penile penetration. Many women don't partner with men and they have wonderful sex lives. So yeah, this idea keeps women in search of this sort of sort of fantasy orgasm that happens within like whatever seconds of penetration. Um, when I watch any kind of show with my kids and there's a sex scene, I always, as soon as there's kissing, I start a counter to see how long it goes from the time when it's supposed to be kind of penetration to orgasm. And it's always like less than five seconds. So it gives this idea to women, this false idea that, you know, a few seconds with a penis and you're just, you know, climbing off the ceiling. And that's such a harmful myth. And we see it perpetuate even in a lot of, you know, women's magazines about, you know, the myths of the vaginal orgasm. There's no myth. It's let's get rid of it. And orgasm, however you achieve your orgasm, that's great. How many times in, in your career you've encountered your colleagues, doctors, who, according to your uh, knowledge, had less than the best intentions towards their patients? Do you have the courage to, are you bold enough to... Uh, sort of talk to other doctors and sort of correct them and try to tell them to maybe mend their ways. To, to, do doctors make a lot of mistakes in their practice? Uh, sort of that women pay for with their uh, vaginal health? Because it's always the question of who they go to, who they ask the, those questions to, and whether this person, another doctor, a doctor, is a good partner to enter into this conversation, just like you, who has a lot of knowledge, as a true scientist, a scientific mind, as someone who battles and combats fake news and stupid myths, and on the other hand, who can really objectively look into the human body, but also who can assess other doctors and how they are trying to help their patients or not help their patients. Well, it's always, so I do find, and we do know from studies, that um, many doctors don't talk about sex and sexuality, that they are uncomfortable with that, that their own discomfort is reflective of society's discomfort. And that's really a shame. So many women come in to the gynecologist and they don't get asked about their sex life or have an opportunity to talk about it. And I mention that quite frequently, but I think it's also important that, you know, there's lots of things I'm not comfortable with in medicine. Like I wouldn't be comfortable doing heart surgery. So, um, you know, you have to be trained. And I, so I think part of the problem is, is a lot of programs don't have training curriculums to sort of teach people how to talk about sex is actually not that hard. You just do it. it and people are desperate to hear the information. Um, I think that part of the problems with um, medical communication, certainly in the United States, is the short amount of time people have with a physician. You know, if you're coming in for care and you have 13 minutes, there's no way, um, you know, the most caring physician can approach the myriad of problems. You know, if you're having problems with your sex life, that's not something you can solve in 13 minutes. Many patients don't even have the courage to bring it up during that time. And, you know, unfortunately, because of those time pressures, many doctors don't even ask. And so the whole system is really just set up that way. I'm very fortunate that in my office, I have a long amount of time with patients because I see people who've had problems elsewhere. So I can start undoing all of that. But so that's why the book was really important for me. So I can give women the language. So they would be able to advocate for themselves in situations where they felt they weren't being heard or give them words when they didn't have those words themselves. What about sexual education, sex education in your country, in the States? How are you doing on this subject? Well, <laughs> well it depends where you live. <laughs> so, um, there are You're from California, right? You live in California. In California, apart from the fact that it's sunny, everything is more beautiful, right? Sort of more peachy. Well, California. California is a huge um, state, and I live along the coast, which is a, 
a beautiful part. Um, and it's beautiful in lots of different ways. So if you're on the ocean or in the mountains, so, um, but where I live is a much more liberal part of California. There are also conservative parts. And so where I live, my kids had amazing sex education at school. They, um, they even, ha you know, I, my boys are now 17. I mean, they're used to, obviously there's like vagina models all over the house. Um, and they're just like, whatever. Uh, they, um, they had this amazing sex education when they were, I think 13. I mean, they even had to label all the parts of the clitoris, right? So here are my two boys and they're just like, yep, oh, that's the bulb, that's the best, you know, they're totally cool with it. Um, and so they learned, you know, that that there's 12 steps to put on a condom. I'm like, 12 steps, what are you talking about? But three of those steps were checking for consent, you know, beginning, middle and end. It was amazing. Um, at the beginning, the educator said, you know, we're, you know, we're gonna start talking, using a lot of terms that maybe you're not familiar with, not everybody talks about sex at home. And so let's get a feel of the room for what people are comfortable with. And my son, Oliver, put his hand up and said, well, my mom wrote about her vagina for the New York Times. <laughs> so the teacher was like, oh, I guess you're comfortable with it. So there's that extreme where there's fantastic education. But then there's also the opposite where there is basically abstinence only sex education where people are just terrified. They're given terrifying information about contraception and sex and told don't do it. And we know that that's actually very harmful. That giving people information actually helps them make better choices for their body. When you were writing in your book, you used wonderful words, uh, very sort of moving words. Uh, for example, you said, what I wrote was my vaginal mission. I'm not sure how it sounded in, the, in your original words, uh, but the way it's been translated into Polish, I, I like it. So you're a missionary, you have a mission. How are you doing? I mean, your country has reached so many countries in the world, your book. So it was needed, it was much needed. So those countries that we believe like, you know, those countries like Germany, Australia, New Zealand, um, that have sort of a positive image, a good image, uh, the United States, Great Britain. It seems that in those countries, such a book may not be as much needed because it's very basic. It talks about very fundamental things. Uh, seemingly everyone knows about these things. But actually, your sales numbers might have even mm, uh, surprised you, yourself. Well, I, I knew women were desperate for this information because every day, almost every day in the office, I was getting the same questions. And I would say, how do women not know? Like, how do people not know this? I thought this was common information, but obviously this is what I've been doing for 30 years. So it's, of course, common to me. Um, but all the little tips and tricks and nuances, you know, a lifetime in medicine, you accumulate a lot of things. You also accumulate the words. You know, a lot of times... Uh, someone will see a different physician and they'll get told exactly the same thing information wise that I said, but I said it in a different way, in a way the person could hear. And so that's an important part of information translation. It's not just the information, it's the communication. And so I think that, that many people need communication about sexuality or sex and body parts in just really plain language. I mean, I like plain language summaries too. It makes it a lot easier for me. So yeah, I think that different, probably in different countries, there's different things people take away. There's different needs. But I would say from my experience, talking with women from all around the world, the questions are almost always the same. True, yeah, but when you uh, read about Gwyneth Paltrow, does she still uh, talk to you uh, about this yoni and uh, those little eggs and all that? Mm. And, and jade eggs, right? Because you wrote that those jade eggs for the yoni was something weird because a little tiny stone egg goes into your vagina to activate your energy or whatever or something like this. Uh, it was, I guess, a little bit um, ironic. So uh, as I went, as I listened to uh, their conference, uh, it was very sort of straight, heterosexual and patriarchal. So do you, are you on speaking terms with Gwyneth still? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I'm a fan. I don't think Gwyneth Paltrow is a fan of mine. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure when she gets interviewed, they're not even allowed to say my name because people always say, oh, that Canadian OBGYN or that, you know, that gynecologist. So, yeah, I think it's pretty amazing that you can have this all this celebrity status, like you can pick the phone and get on the cover of People magazine. And, uh, you know, just some gynecologist sitting in her dining room writing stuff can um, bring down your empire. So, yeah, I don't I don't like when people sell junk to women. I don't like when people lie to women about their bodies. I find that really offensive. And you don't empower women by selling them useless rocks or um, supplements. You empower them with accurate information. So yeah, Gwyneth isn't my buddy. <laughs> Rozumiem ją w jakimś tam sensie. Natomiast pomyślałam jeszcze, że dosyć od, odważnie. I understand that very boldly and very you. It's very you when you talk about heterosexual and sort of uh, kowtowing to patriarchal ideas and notions. So to what extent is our world and the human, the female body, how much it's sort of uh, submissive in the sense uh, of being controlled by patriarchy. We've gone such a long way. Ha we are half of humanity. We should have equal rights. They allowed us to talk about these things. But are we still enjoying? Are we already enjoying those equal rights? Patriarchy is still there, very much inside, entrenched in the female body, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, until we have centuries and centuries of women leaders, uh, we're not going to have equality, right? I mean, we still haven't had a female president in the United States. If you look at all all of the countries around the world, definitely there are countries that have, you know, have had female leaders or have female leaders currently, but it's not, you know, when you look at their whole history, it's just very, very recently, you know. And, uh, and even then there's, you know, questions that come up about, you know, the way that, that women are approached by the press is so different, right, than how men are approached by the press. They don't comment on the clothes men wear on campaign trails. They don't, you know, comment on their makeup, you know, or their hair or things like that. So I think that we see that sort of people and those heteronormative expectations, right? Like how could a woman run for office? Doesn't she have children she has to look for, look after? You know, no one ever, well, what about if she's partnered with a man, why isn't he looking after the kids? Maybe she's not partnered with a man at all. Maybe she's not partnered, who knows? Who cares? You know, nobody ever, you know, imposes those, those, those sort of family values onto men. And we see that whether it's political or talking about the body. And I think that uh, for us to have true equality, then we really, talking about people's biology has to just not be part of their success or part of what makes them a good leader. Um, you know, I think that there are so many different kinds of women. And to compare me to, um, to a woman who grew up in a different environment, even in the same city, Right. Um, you know, there are so many amazing flavors and types of women. Um, you know, we whether you partner with men, whether you partner with women, whether you're trans, all of these make up this whole beautiful diaspora of women. And so I think that we have to get beyond judging us by biology and just judging us for being awesome. Do you think that female body is still kind of political, it's a philosophical question, it kind of crossed my mind. Uh, uh, can feminine body, female body be politicized? Can we actually um, take it from the political perspective? I'm asking it because you are very uh, politically active. Uh, you comment on the American reality around you in an active way. Yeah, I mean, well, in America, we're certainly going backwards there with laws about um, abortion and contraception. I mean, these are medical decisions. They don't have any place in laws. Um, for example, in Canada, there's no abortion law. It's not legal. It's not illegal. It's just a procedure. And, you, you, know, you know, access is still not as good as it should be. But, you know, 
nothing catastrophic has happened to society. In fact, they have a lower abortion rate. How about that? That's what knowledge and access does. So, you know, these whole ideas, politicizing women's bodies, you know, making, making these, um, you know, rules about contraception or abortion, or, you know, talking about, you know, the importance of being a virgin for getting married, things like that. Those, those are ways to control women. They're, they're impossible standards or, um, they're, they really, take the control of your own body away from you and give it to somebody else. And it's incredibly damaging. I mean, the one of the biggest myths that's in almost every culture is this myth of the hymen, that the hymen has anything to do with this virginity. And virginity is a social construct. You know, hymens have nothing to do with sex or um, sexuality or virginity, and yet it's so entrenched. So, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, and that's why I feel I don't have any option but to be politically active. I actually uh, start understanding better your vaginal mission because after reading your book, I thought that you kind of set all these myths on the uh, female body. You uh, actually you were getting ready with your weapon, yes, and uh, you were actually shooting at these myths. Uh, so you're explaining the uh, origins of the hymen, for instance, yes? I highly recommend this part of the book because it's very interesting. The author is actually uh, basing the existence of the hymen on her uh, experience. That's a great concept. And uh, you, uh, this cotton white pants, uh, shall we wear like uh, uh, lace pants, beautiful lace pants or not? Uh, shall we? <laughs> Shall, we, shall a woman actually wear this beautiful, sexy, white or black uh, lace panties or not? I, uh, I also uh, also uh, remember something about think, uh, strengthening libido. Uh, it's another myth, yet another myth, uh, actually, you were writing about, about zinc. I will quote now. Uh, in supplements, dietary supplements should increase libido. In some research, actually, it turned out that rats that received zinc was actually having a stronger friction movement during uh, intercourse, yes? How sexy the writer, the author writes. And actually, they have increased sexual competence. How horrible it is. Uh, but injecting zinc in... Uh, testicles of dogs actually uh, in, uh, uh, infected uh, affected actually the reproductive uh, competences so sexual competence of the red could be a great name of a punk about well, rock actually band that never left actually the garage because the first single freaks actually did not reach to the top um, of any um, well I'm just uh, quoting it uh, to show how Adequate, actually, uh, Jen uh, is actually acting against all these myths and uh, that we can read, for instance, online in internet. But probably your life will not be long enough actually to shoot out at all these myths that uh, you can find on Google, on Google. Google. Right. Yeah. And I mean, to be a woman is to be surrounded with myths about your body, and. It's amazing, you know, I just don't hear these same myths about men's bodies. I mean, certainly there's myths about like health in general, but but it's really, it's there's so much mythology with women's bodies. And I think it gets back to this original idea of not being able to discuss it accurately. And also, you know, if you go back to the very genesis of Western medicine, if you go back to the time of Hippocrates, which, you know, became really the basis for all of European, Arabic medicine, really, a, vast part of medical care. And, you know, they, they believe that women had inferior bodies, that we were biologically inferior. This wasn't based on, you know, any kind of research because they didn't take, they didn't dissect cadavers and have any information. And so um, what they believed was that women were wet and spongy and that we, we didn't perspire appropriately. That's why we leaked blood once a month to get rid of the excess fluid. And it seems like, you know, we haven't come much further than that in a lot of ways, that we keep building on myths. And I think it just gets back to this idea that 
if we don't talk about it, if we don't approach the myths head on, you know, and have these conversations to say, why do you believe that? You know, why are you looking for supplements about libido? Let's talk about what libido really is for women. It's not about being spontaneously horny all the time. Um, you know, libido can be different for different people. Let's actually discuss what that means. Tell me, what is the correlation between the sexuality of women and uh, sex education? Can you see any correlation in this association here? Well, I'm, I don't know the literature, but my guess would be, uh, my educated guess would be that, that women who receive more quality information about their bodies early on through sex education are far more empowered about their sexuality. I mean, if you don't know how to achieve an orgasm, if you don't know that, for example, penile penetration is the least um, reliable way to achieve an orgasm, um, if you don't know about vibrators, if, if your partner doesn't know that, I mean, I see so many women who've had horrible things said to them by their first, the first guy they partnered with because that person didn't know anything about sex you know, and they were, you know, imposing this false standard on their partner. They didn't know about foreplay. They didn't know about, um, you know, about the fact that it's probably better for their female partner to have an orgasm before they get to penetration, right? If you teach people how to have good quality sex, um, I think that, you know, you empower them also then to leave bad relationships to when someone says something terrible about their body to get up and walk out. So I think that, that quality knowledge early on it is going to be far more helpful and and also quality sex education includes discussion about consent right and so you know when i grew up in the time of the 1980s um nobody talked about date rape that wasn't a thing it didn't exist um you know you were expected to give in if a guy was you know you know begging or forcing if you were on a date you owed it to him and uh imagine if i had been taught when I was 13, that that's not how, how it was, that, that, that if you're feeling pressured, that's wrong. And so, yeah, I think that, that sex education, I believe is, you know, the first tool to, um, to, you know, to empowerment. And now a brutal question from Poland. Are you watching porn movies? Do you watch porn movies? Do I watch do I watch yes. porn? No, porn's not really my thing, but I like erotica. I like reading erotic stuff. So I have a very active imagination. Um, so, you know, I know there, are, I know lots of people who do like porn. It's just not my thing, but I love erotica. It's a provocative question because I wanted to ask you actually how the porn business influence uh, the way we perceive our sexuality or women perceive uh, 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 their sexuality. Do you think it's harmful? this influence, this impact can be harmful? Well, I think that, um, you know, when you say pornography, that's like saying movies. There's such a wide spectrum, right? You can see amazing movies that prevent, um, present women in very um, empowering situations. And you can see horrible movies where women are treated terribly. And I think that, that porn has that same spectrum. So I think that, you know, from what I see that what's popular in mainstream porn um, certainly doesn't seem very female centric, but there's also lots of porn that's made by women that have better storylines. And so I think that people should have access to the entertainment that they like. I think what's really important though, is that erotic, whether it's you're reading erotica, whether you're watching porn, whether you're watching a movie, right? Whether you're watching Game of Thrones on television, which has like a lot of, you know, very sort of, you know, sexy scenes in it, that that's entertainment. It's not educational. And I think that that's, um, it's acting. And I think that's a really important point that when people see movies or when they see, you know, mainstream movies, when they see pornography, when they, you know, when they read erotica, this isn't, um, this is an educational text. This is fantasy. And it's just important to not mistake that fantasy for what might happen in real life. That's all. In your book, you also uh, talk about the history of medicine. Uh, you write that what we know about the human body or what we've learned about the human body over years actually uh, comes from uh, men. You said that hun uh, several hundred years ago, uh, the uh, men who uh, 
Men who actually dealt with uh, uh, the uh, medicine were not able actually to um, to perform. To perform the post mortem on women. Uh, do you think there are some areas, undiscovered areas, in uh, women, feminine, feminine bodies that uh, could be um, a discovery uh, that should receive the Nobel Prize? Well, um, I don't know about that. Um, I think it's always hard to know what you haven't discovered yet. So I think that, you know, so it's very true that for um, for much of medicine up until probably, you know, one, a couple of hundred years ago, women's bodies weren't, you know, weren't examined by male physicians in the office, or if they were, it was, you know, under skirts and things where they're reaching up, I can't even see anything. Um, that that cadavers weren't even dissected until really the 15, 1600s. And the reason, and even then, you know, the dissection of women's bodies was far behind men. So, you know, so we've had this lack of anatomic knowledge. Certainly um, because the clitoris is largely an internal structure and um, in cadavers, you know, the when the blood is drained, organs change shape. Having an actual understanding of how the clitoris worked really wasn't possible until MRI technology came along. So you could actually study how the or you know the organ worked. And these all these there are elegant studies where you know women masturbate in MRI scanners and they they look at what happens to all the different tissues. There's even studies where people have sex in MRI scanners. Uh, so I think that that's really you know so I think that. As we develop new technology, it's always possible that we can learn new things because if we don't have that technology, we don't even know what we can't study. You know, when I think of when I was in medical school in the 80s, PCR, the, the way that we do the tests for COVID and many other things, many of the tests for STDs, those didn't exist when I was in medical school. So there was no even way to know that we could detect small fragments of DNA. So I think that as new technologies come along, we may learn more things. And I think that it's just important that many times uh, when studies happen, women are excluded or there aren't stud there's lack of diversity in studies. So I think it's very, very important to push for parity. So as new technology comes along, we make sure that we're evaluating it in everybody. What does your experience tell you? Are women better gynecologists obstetricians or men are better obstetricians and gynecologists? Uh, do you think that the fact that women can actually study herself, her body herself actually, is uh, perceived as a handicap or a benefit? Can men actually get better as a gynecologist obstetrician, as good actually, can be as good as woman who knows her body so well? From all experience. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't think that you have to have a body part or um, have a medical condition to be a really good physician in that area. I mean, certainly look at all our cancer specialists. You know, most of them haven't had cancer. Uh, I think I was a great obstetrician before I'd ever been pregnant myself. Um, and, you know, my experience with pregnancy or my experience with menopause or my experience with my periods might be very different from um, from my patients. So I think that um, that there are amazing female physicians and there's amazing male physicians. I mean, I I was trained by almost exclusively male gynecologists given the, you know, the, the time and some were amazing and compassionate and had the most, you know, the most incredible insight and others were awful. Um, I think that perhaps some women feel more at ease immediately with someone who is, you know, has the same body parts and that might certainly affect communication. But I think that, you know, the, um, it's not really who, you know, who you are physically matters less than who you are, I think, in your head uh, for, you know, how open are you, how much do you listen to your patients? So, um, you know, I think that there's a, you know, a slight advantage to, to, you know, for example, you know, having had a period, but you know what, there's, there's many women who, you know, don't get periods for lots of different reasons. And, you know, I think they're able to talk to women about their periods just fine. When, for the last time, actually, you assisted at the birth of a, a child, you are a gynecologist obstetrician, actually. So are you still active in this profession or not? 
Um, I don't deliver babies anymore. I haven't uh, delivered a baby since I think maybe 2005. I think that was the last time. I, I started pretty early in medical school. And so um, I did obstetrics for, um, you know, for about 12 years and then um, and then focused just more on gynecology because that's uh, I had a sort of a unique expertise in the vulva and vagina and dealing with, you know, sexual problems. And since that was a real big uh area where there was definitely a need, uh, I felt that I was probably better off there. So, um, so yeah, so no more, no more obstetrics for me, although I'm pretty sure I could do a delivery, um, you know, if I had to on an airplane or something. <laughs> Can I risk a statement that you're a TV star? You have this show, Jen's Planning. So you're a TV personality. You are, you have celebrity status in the States. Do people recognize you in the street? Um, uh, sometimes I get recognized, a little bit more so in Canada. Um, but I'll tell you, I, um, you know, when I first started dating my partner last year and I told him, I said, well, I'm a little bit famous. And he's like, I never heard of you. And I said, okay, well, what, you know, I'm just telling you. And uh, we were on our second date and we we're sitting at a street cafe um, in, uh, in California. And this woman stopped and she's like, oh my God, are you Jen Gunter? And he was like, so, <laughs> and he was so sweet. He stepped, you know, she wanted a selfie and he's like, oh, I'll take it. And he stepped up and when he went to take the picture, he went, save vagina. <laughs> so I knew he was the keeper. Uh, when it comes to the wonderful uh, cover of your book, it's behind you. Were you also part of creating this uh, sort of zipper and uh, creating this image? Was it your idea? Did you have a hand in this? Sort of a pink zipper? No. I didn't. Um, I certainly had the right of refusal. So, but no, um, uh, an amazing female graphic designer came up with this. And um, the American cover, um, this is um, embossed. So as you run your finger down the zipper, you can feel all little kinds of bumps. And so it's actually um, embossed. This is amazing. We have the same as the American version. And if you still don't have your copy, guys, regret. Because it's amazing. This is great. Divine. I don't know if it's nicer to trace your finger uh, when you're a man or whether when you're a female. But anyway, no. So our Polish publishing house also made sure that it's embossed and that Polish readers can also feel the structure, <laughs> feel the texture. Amazing, really great. So tell me how much time it took for you, because the, it reads very quickly, even though it's like over 40 pages, 400 pages, but how long did, you did it take for you to do this research to sort of, you know, have this book complete? All the knowledge in one book. Well, the yeah, the book didn't actually take that long to write. Um, I probably wrote the book in four months. Um, but I, I had been doing the, you know, this is what I do all of the time. And so, you know, I spent several months beforehand, um, you know, rechecking kind of all my facts. I really had the book in my head. I knew exactly how I wanted it to be laid out. Um, because, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I, you know, I've always like, this is what I want everyone, woman to know about this. This is what I want everybody to know about that. And so there was a little bit of extra research that was required, um, obviously. And, you know, I fact checked everything, even things I thought that I had, you know, known. But, um, but yeah, so it took about four months to put the whole thing together, which I understand is quite quick. Um, the book I'm working on right now is taking a little bit longer, but um, it's almost done. So uh, that'll be turned in at the end of September. And it's on menopause. It's called the Menopause Manifesto. <laughs> I regret that I was not uh, taking notes on my life as a TV journalist and a TV personality. I didn't take notes. I have bad memory, so I don't have a book in me. Ah, it was a joke. Pure Love. This is the title of the eighth uh, Big Book Festival. Uh, what about you when you hear the phrase pure love? What does it mean to you? Oh, uh, pure love? Hmm. I'm not sure. I think that might mean different things for different people. So the I find the word pure is so loaded. You know, does it mean something 
puritanical? Does it mean something um, that's just honest for you? So um, I think pure love would be what feels right in your heart. When you talked about the, how you first started dating with your uh, partner, uh, so can you sort of draw a line between the notion of pure love and your love life in the sense that you are experienced, you are mature, you have wonderful, uh, great moments in your life. You've had them in your life. I hope they're still uh, ahead of you. So have you had pure love in your life? Have you experienced it? Um, yeah, question. I mean, I, I have to tell you. Yeah, sure. I'm always happy to answer anything. Um, the, I would say that I am very fortunate that me because I wasn't partnered. I you know, married someone who I knew that I really shouldn't be marrying, but I just really didn't think that there was another path. And um, I made choices based on the weight of the patriarchy. Uh, even me, I mean, it's just sometimes things are so oppressive. And, uh, you know, in my 40s, I just was like, fuck it. I just, this is ridiculous. I can't live my life this way. And I'm just going to be true to me. And, uh, and I thought there wasn't going to be anyone who was going to like me, who was for me, who I am, um, unfiltered. And, um, and then this amazing man came along and, uh, and so, yeah, here we are. And, um, you know, we were going to come together to Poland for the, the festival. And so hopefully we'll be able to come together, um, you know, when all of this madness is over. And do you think that this madness will be over? As a doctor, do you think it's possible for it to be over? Where are we? At what stage of this madness are we currently? As a doctor, what do you think? I think the, yeah. So I think the issue is that this is such a new virus, right? So when we talk about other pandemics like measles or polio or, you know, HIV, you know, we had years and years and years of data before we, we started, you know, coming up with effective treatments. And obviously that means also that there was years and years of suffering before there was treatment. I think that so many people expect that we, that science is going to be right like that. And they forget that, you know, we just found about this virus in December and, you know, we're not even a year into it. Um, I am hopeful. I think that at some point we're going to get back to, um, a, a semblance of normal, or we're going to get back to a new normal. I think that's always important to remember. Uh, I think that right now, though, we're still we're still struggling. Certainly in the United States, we're struggling with terrible leadership um, and political weapon weaponizing. You know, um, health agencies for for political gain. And I think as long as that happens, it's going to be very difficult. Um, I think that we're still struggling here, you know, with, with getting people to wear masks, to, um, to uh, people can't take time off work if they're exposed or ill. And so it's exposing a lot of um, really health in inadequacies in the American system here. Um, and we're certainly seeing people, um, you know, people who are disadvantaged through racism or poverty or both, um, you know, having far worse um, outcomes. And so we have a lot of systematic inequalities to work on. And so I think that the, there's a long way to go, definitely. But I feel that at some point, we're going to be able to go to movie theaters, and we're going to be able to get on airplanes. And I think that's going to happen. I just not sure when. No one is sure when, right? I guess. Jen, you're saying, you're writing that power and health are inextricably linked. What makes you think so? Power and health. What makes you think so? This link. Well, if you, if you, yeah, if you can't advocate for your own health, right? If you're unwell, if you, that has so many impacts in everything in your domain. It affects how you live, how you love, how you are able to go to work. And, um, you know, you, the ability to, to know about your body and how your body works, you know, to me, that's as important, um, as having clean air, um, access to quality food, um, you know, not living in, um, an area where with, um, you know, endemic violence or political oppression. I think that's sort of like a core human right. Are there any questions from internet users? I don't, probably I'm asking all the right questions and no one has anything, but no, guys, if you have something, please ask. And if not, I can still continue. 
asking questions about the Vagina Bible. No questions from the audience? Right, nothing. Jen, have you been or were you surprised in any of the countries as your book has been published, Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Germany, Czech, Romania, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Australia, oh my, you must be very rich, Australia, New Zealand, China, the States, Canada, Great Britain, any of those countries, are you a record-breaking bestseller? Are you, you know, uh, are you selling wonderfully? Are you breaking any records? Well, um, I'm not, I don't think I've broken any records for sure. Um, but I did make it to the New York Times bestseller list in the States, which is cool. Um, and I was a number one bestseller for many, many weeks in Canada. So that's fantastic. Um, the A lot of the countries, the book's not out yet. So I think it's, it's out in Germany, obviously out in Poland and out in Russia. Um, and then the UK, Canada and the States. A lot of the translations are done, and I think that their COVID kind of pushed a lot off. So there, there's that. I think it's coming out. Oh, the, the Portuguese edition's out as well. Um, and so, you know, I hope that um, while it's wonderful to be on bestseller lists and have that, um, you know, lunch, what I really hope is this just is a book with staying power. So people always have access to it. And because there's always, you know, new people that need to learn. And so I hope, my hope is that it has longevity. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's very exciting to be in so many countries. I mean, it's going to be published in China and South Korea and Thailand and, um, you know, so many different countries around the world. And I think the fact that it's been picked up by so many publishers is that, you know, the questions are really all the same, that, um, that we're, we're all so linked as, as, as women, not only, you know, by our shared physiology, but, but actually more by our shared experiences. Um, and that, um, that, you know, hopefully I can help, um, women combat some of the systematic patriarchy by having accurate information. When you think about women all around the world, the role of women, the circumstances of women, the fact that those in power uh, control their bodies, like for, for, for example, the Arab world, in which countries do you think your Bible would be most needed, where you would feel it's an achievement, it's great that I've reached this country because those women, because of their systems of power, are completely sort of cut off from controlling their own bodies. Where do you think your book would be most needed? I don't know, because I think that there is is great oppression in lots of different places. And I don't think I'm probably educated enough about every country to know um, the nuances of their specific problems. Um, you know, uh, someone from Romania told me she was very excited that the book was being published there because, you know, you know, under their totalitarian uh, regime for so long, they, they had such a complete sort of oppression of, of you know, really access to accurate information. But, you know, even in a country that, that seems seems as liberal as as Canada um, you know there are huge pockets of misinformation and so I think that um, I think it's it's needed everywhere and I just think that um, I, I think that the themes are actually very very consistent um, maybe there's been a few more access problems in different areas but you know you can live in a rural part of a of a big industrialized country and still have difficulty accessing care. I think one amazing thing is that the internet has brought knowledge to so many people in so many places um, and uh, and allowed them to, you know, to really access better quality information, too. Um, but, you know, there's parts of the United States where um, there is absolutely zero access to any kind of um, information, accurate healthcare information about your body. Right. So so we, there's problems everywhere. Do you think that books can change the world, that they can affect change in individuals, uh, in the way they see the world? So could the Vagina Bible be one of those books, sort of building up human consciousness, human awareness, not only in females, in women, but also lots of men could find very interesting things about uh, the bodies of their female partners. So can your book be, could yeah. your book be one of books that help build aware, conscious societies? I hope so. I absolutely think books can change people. I mean, I've 
I've been changed by many books that I've read. And I get so many wonderful messages from women all around the world who've read my book uh, about how it's helped them. You know, they always thought that they were broken. That's so sad. Um, or they, you know, never, you know, were never able to talk to a partner about what was going on sexually, or they realized they were able to advocate for their, you know, with their doctor. One of my favorite stories is um, a woman who'd, you know, read something that I wrote and she wanted to get an IUD. And um, a lot of doctors erroneously believe that you can't have an IUD if you've never been pregnant. That's not true. Um, it's sort of based on sort of puritanical, you know, all of these things are based on these puritanical ideas that a woman shouldn't have sex before marriage, right? Or that you have to save your body for pregnancy. And uh, she went in prepared. And uh, when he said that, no, you can't have an IUD if you've never been pregnant, she sort of, you know, slammed down something I wrote on the table and said, well, Dr. Gunter says I can't. So I'm not leaving without the IUD. And she got her IUD. Dobry, Jen, powiedz nam, co ty będziesz robić teraz w taki jakiś piękny, słoneczny, kalifornijski, niedzielny wczesny. So, wonderful Sunday afternoon in California. What are you doing today? What are you up to? Are you still giving interviews? Are you promoting your book online? What about the life of a world famous author in California? What's your life? <laughs> life <laughs> Uh, well, um, I'm with my amazing partner right now. And uh, last night I spent um, <laughs> hours making broth um, because we're going to have homemade ramen today. Um, so we got some fresh salmon yesterday and I'm going to make a, a big bowl of ramen noodles with salmon. So today is actually I'm going to be cooking and I'm going to be writing and I'll probably take go out with the dog for a walk. And, um, and then we're going to watch a movie tonight. So um, a Japanese movie about ramen. So we're having a ramen themed evening. <laughs> But with the whole sort of slow down, you know, we've been spending our time biking, hiking. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to live in an incredibly beautiful part of um, California. And so we try to take advantage of going out when we can. Um, but we also just sit around and laugh and talk to Right. You're such a wonderful example of how being aware, being conscious can help make your life better, that you live with who you want to be, with who you want to be with, that you can choose who you are and who you are with and that you can combine and reconcile all the parts of your life. You've written this book about men menopause. Uh, it's not yet out in Poland. Are you on your next idea already? Do you have? your next thing in in mind? Mm, you know, like a trilogy, uh, vagina, menopause, what <laughs> else is up your sleeve? Yeah, there'll be a third book. I haven't quite figured out what it's going to be yet, but I think it'll be basically about general gynecology, you know, kind of a guide to your body. Um, and uh, yeah, I have, um, I did a podcast, I did a, a TED talk on um, periods and why we have them and why they hurt so much. Um, and I believe there's a Polish translation. So um, so that's up on TED, you can watch that. And um, I'm uh, kicking around some ideas for a podcast. So we'll see. Uh, I'm gonna film another season of Jen Splaining, my TV show, as soon as I can travel to Canada because there's a travel ban right now. Um, so yeah, so we'll see. And then trying to just cause trouble. <laughs> what about your kids having a mother like you that is you I know that your home probably your home is full of books and materials about female health uh, books models and so on so kids are kids live in the same house right but do they already show yes. some interest in your world your profession what you're interested in Well, they do. They think it's so. They think it's funny that I'm sort of semi-famous. They'll be like, "That woman's looking at you." And I'm like, "It's okay. Don't worry about it." Um, they're pretty sweet. Uh, like I said, there's models of vaginas all over the house, vagina books, you know, all kinds of stuff. They're totally oblivious to it. Um, my one of my sons um, is is gay and he tells me he's a platinum gay which means he's never touched a vagina so he was born by c-section <laughs> and he's very proud that he knows more about the vagina than most straight guys so um you know i think that my kids are really testimony to the fact that if you just talk openly about sex 
like it's nothing else or it's about body parts, then it doesn't become anything else. And then they just learn information and um, that makes them very comfortable. And, um, you know, they'll like, you know, it's sweet that they say a lot of their friends who are girls follow me on Instagram and I see their, you know, their friends liking stuff that I write. And I think that's, that's, that's wonderful for, um, 15, 16, 17 year old, um, girls and boys, young women and young men to see empowering messages and about standing up. And, uh, I think back to, you know, when I was that age and seeing women stand up, um, about access to abortion in Canada actually at the time was what really got me interested in women's health, that, uh, abortion was, uh, required uh, special, you had to get special permission. And, and, um, I, I sort of came of age of the time where there was, um, where women, you know, women and men were advocating for change. And so I was empowered by those people. And I hope that I can inspire other people to be, um, to speak up about injustice, um, as well. Powiedz mi jeszcze, bo tak przez chwilę tu się przewijamy, tylko prześlizgujemy po temacie patriarchatu, ale... We just mentioned the topic of patriarch, patriarchat. Uh, the person uh, successful as you are actually, being a woman, are you often approached and ask how you bring together your professional and biological role, and uh, like a private role, yes, in your personal life? Because since a uh, while well, I have this impression that... Uh, we should be just this and uh, just sorry, and we should ask both mothers and fathers how they cope with their roles. Yes, I don't know how many men you know who are asked actually about the fact whether you, professor, are able actually to combine these two roles. You're such a famous person, you published so many books, but how your uh, sons actually reacted towards that. Yes, but and women are also asked about that. Women are asked actually, uh, you know, if they uh, are mothers and if they actually come to work, they look good actually. They, uh, everybody thinks, ah, because be, uh, the kids are neglected, uh, women don't really take care of their kids. Yes, and so. Uh, what I mean is actually we should be more just. We should actually we should uh, move away from paternity and fater uh, fa uh, sorry fraternity. Uh, we should move away from the paternity and maternity. So basically, you know, we rather actually should uh, release women from this role of being mothers only. I absolutely agree. I, you know, I, you see interview after interview where the woman is asked, oh, well, like, how do you work and look after your kids? And, you know, no one ever says to, you know, the man, or they rarely say, oh, you have two children. How does, how does that fit in with your busy lifestyle? So I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, we need to ask people the same questions because you're, you know, you're being judged on a skill set. And this whole, you know, this bias that, that, you know, we say that, you know, that women should be, um, you know, doing it all or staying at home, um, or implying that, you know, we should ask women different questions. I mean, that, you know, you should be spending all of the time, you know, talking about, you know, the, 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 you know, the meat of the matter, or, you know, not, you know, not what, not the, not the questions that are only asked of half the population. And I think that we'll only have parity when that happens. You know, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when male politicians are, are asked about, you know, about their clothes or what about their kids at home or, you know, how, how do they, how can they possibly get dinner on the table and work full time? You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, you know, because, you know, the other thing too, is there are wonderful men who, who do, um, contribute 50% or more to some households. Absolutely. And I think that the thing about the patriarchy is it's damaging to men too. Right, because it's this toxic masculinity sort of um, sort of uh, theme, and that's as dam that's damaging to everybody. You know, the only people who benefit from that are people who want to maintain the status quo. Okay, one more second about the politics, because in a moment we you have the election in the U.S. So, uh, are you a person who believe in um, who believes in uh, change? 
we had we experienced so-called good change. I don't know what about you, whether you will have a good change, but appointment for Kamala Harris as a candidate actually to become the vice president of the US is also a signal, a symbol actually, the signal actually sent to the whole world and the hope for all women around the globe, uh, showing that women can be changed, right? So what do you expect actually from the uh, presidential elections in the US? Uh, are you afraid of it? Are you have, I don't know, do you hope for something? What is your opinion on that? Well, I feel, uh, and this is going to sound very alarmist, um, but I feel that this election is a vote for democracy, yes or no. And America has a very unique democracy where you can stand up and you can say whatever you want. And I, many of the things that I've written online, I wouldn't have been able to write if I'd lived in other countries, right? So this incredible protection of free speech, this incredible ability to stand up and question your leaders and to demand that you question your leaders, that, that democracy requires that kind of participation. But it's also fragile, and um, we are seeing, you know, these um, very, very frightening um, sort of uh, fascism and racism, and all of these. I mean, the racism has always been here, but this, this sort of this role, I, I, it, you know, we have we're we're getting fascism here, and you know, my my parents um, grew up during, you know you know, during the war, the Second World War, and I heard lots of stories about, you know, these kinds of, you know, concerning things about, uh, and then here we are, and I feel like I'm, you know, I'm reliving maybe parts of what they lived when they were younger, like, you know, the, the idea that there are armed protesters on the streets who are supporting, you know, a fascist government is very frightening. And I feel that, you know, the way that our system is set up, there are so many checks and balances. And the Trump administration has systematically started to um, to take the guardrails down. That was sort of an analogy that um, that someone said that that our democracy is kept on a straight on a straight lines with with these checks and balances that act like guardrails, and those are coming down. And um, I feel that if if we um, if Trump is reelected in a few months' time, that that American democracy as we know it is not going to be here. And I think that's very concerning, um, not just for us here, but for you know um, for a lot of other people as well. So I'm sure lots of countries are watching what's going on here. Now the good news is um, Kamala Harris is um, you know it is amazing to see such an accomplished woman. No one can ask her a question that she can't answer. She She's 20 steps ahead. She is, I mean, everything that I, I hear her talk and I think, oh my God, I can't believe you said that's so amazing. So so that this incredible hope is there. Um, and so so we have, you know, we have, we have hope. And so we just need to vote for hope because um, hope is, um, you know, a politician who cares. Joe Biden has so much empathy for people. And, you know, he wants to put the guardrails back up. And then I see this incredible future in Kamala Harris. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of hope there. So um, I'm hoping to do everything that I can to try to reach out um, and uh, encourage people in America to get out and vote and um, to understand the gravity of this election. When we talk about Kamala Harris, I uh, actually realize there are two American uh, women who represent uh, the uh, potential future. Kamala, on the one hand, who says actually who is 20 steps ahead of everyone, he's got, she's got answers to everything. And then on the other hand, Ivanka Trump, the other face, who says, I love my daddy. America actually needs my daddy. Uh, that's what she says. And I wanted to ask uh, about your impression when you compare these two ladies, actually. What uh, are your first four thoughts? My first thoughts are um, it, Kamala Harris represents, um, you know, absolute intelligence and thought and um, just you know, an just incredible person. And um, she's also, you know, you see her with her family and, and just, I, I think she's a very real, in, just an incredible person. You know, she's the kind of woman that, you know, that I, I, I wish I were friends with, you know, I mean, I, I shouldn't say I have friends who are like her. I would love to be friends with her. No she's tak, just to me someone. Teraz, yeah, spe especially that Gwyneth Paltrow is no longer your friend, so we have to find a new one. <laughs> 
Exactly. But, you know, Ivanka Trump is, is nepotism. You know, she's standing up there, my father, my father, my father, you know, she, she would not be working in the White House if she were not the president's daughter. Right. And Kamala Harris is representing the country because of the work that she's achieved on her own. And so I think that you see, um, you know, the I would say that Kamala Harris represents feminism, you know, as it is evolving. And I would say that Ivanka Trump represents a patriarchal misogynistic system um, that, uh, you know, that is filled with nepotism and is not um, rewarding someone for anything that they have done. Um, it's rewarding someone because they're upholding the status quo uh, because they are. And I think that she is um, especially damaging because um, she has a very, uh, I would say, classic um, uh, feminine look, right? So she looks the way the press, movies, um, those types of things, those, you know, those looks that are elevated, which shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. But, um, but so I think that, you know, you can cloak, um, you can cloak patriarchy in anything. So you, you have to look beyond the exterior and listen to the message. And her message is very concerning. Jen, Jen, send her your book. Oh, send her my book? Send your book to Ivanka, to Ivanka Trump. Oh, send send, send, to, send her send, your book to sell. Ivanka, not sell, it. send. Anyway. <laughs> send. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I'd rather send it to someone who it would help. Um, who would who would read the pages? Um, I don't think that someone like Ivanka Trump is interested in factual information. She's interested in upholding the status quo. Um, hearing what hearing the messages that come out from our White House are terrifying. Um, you know, recently, just this past week, there have been um, you know the Centers for Disease Control has has been giving us terrible messaging about we should be testing less for COVID. And, you know, that's because the president wants there to look like the cases are going down before the election. Um, this is very concerning. This is, um, you know, people people are going to die and uh, and needlessly, absolutely needlessly, preventatively. Um, and so I think that, yeah, Ivanka Trump represents that to me. I don't think she would read it. Um, so, but, uh, you know, hopefully that... Um, you know, hopefully I, I, hopefully I won't have to think about her after the first week of November again. I do understand your choices. I know who we're going to uh, vote for already. I wish you that in the U.S. you can enjoy the triumph of uh, uh, femininity. So if Trump actually wins the election, then Kamala Harris will be, uh, if Biden, sorry, if Biden uh, wins the election, uh, Kamala Harris will be able to represent uh, all the values that uh, women across the globe uh, fight for. So fingers crossed and you will show us how to do things in America. We'll see it in November. And out of formality, I will ask uh, people if they have any questions. No one. Everyone wants to go and sell the book. By the way, I, if I were you, I would send four copies to the White House. Maybe someone at least touched the cover. Oh, no, no, let's not even touch the topic. We know who Donald Trump is. And unfortunately, actually, in all these matters, that should not concern him. By the way, I'm deeply in love with the cover of the book as a, a person. Uh, I'm a woman, actually. I, I really have to say that it was fantastic that you take your 30 year uh, experience out of your head, you put it into packed into your book, and this book could be a great gift to everyone mother, daughter, uh, everyone who loves uh, his, her woman. The Vagina Bible is simply uh, something, you know, it talks about basics, and uh, this is something that everybody should. Uh, read. Uh, so, again, uh, greetings from Warsaw. We should have actually had stormy weather, but we send greetings to sunny California, and we do hope that actually you and the love of your life uh, uh, come to Poland once uh, all this craze actually um, is over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.
Dziękujemy, dziękujemy także Państwu, którzy nas oglądaliście. Uh, thank you very much. We'd like to thank everyone who followed us on Facebook and on... Uh, no, sorry, we were not present at Facebook, so uh, we were on... Uh, uh, online, on YouTube, maybe? Uh, because I'm in love in YouTube now. I'm in love with YouTube. So, um, you know, uh, once you're ready with watching, once you finish watch, actually jump to my uh, site. I have great uh, interviews, not necessarily with Jen, but with other uh, interesting people. I have actually, I interviewed a blog, a founder who writes a blog, actually, and we have the interesting conversation about uh, uh, the restart of the school and who explains that only uh, parents are terrified with uh, this restarting the school and uh, kids are very happy about it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.